Stanley Westleader. Hello, that guy. And we are going to get Stanley Westleader in here, and uh, we are going to attempt to get it figured out with Stanley. Last week, we were supposed to have Stanley on this broadcast, but every time we kept calling him, the number kept uh, telling me he wasn't available. <laughs> so, we have the right phone number this week, and we are going to call Stanley West later. So we got to call him on the old Skip Skype, the old Skype Rooney. The Skype Rooney. I'm going to talk to him on the phone, but he's going to be on audio Skype, so he'll join us, hopefully, here in a few moments. And uh, maybe. There's Stan. How are you, sir? Okay. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. We have, uh, we have got a great guest joining us today here on our broadcast. Thanks for joining us here on iHeartRadio and also AMFM, 247.com. Tune in, iTunes, of course, uh, TalkShoe.com. Uh, if you're watching us on the old Twitch live stream, we would like you to uh, add us as a friend over there on Twitch or like us or do whatever the hell it is. And uh, we have got Stan Weisleader with us today. He joins us live here on telephone. And um, Stan is a uh, just an amazing, amazing guy. He was a detective with the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department for 23 years, working with Child Abuse Unit of Special Victims, and was also the oldest one to have graduated from the Academy. He wrote a screenplay about his experience, and if anyone's looking for a story with a slam-bang action and love interest, you need to give this guy a call. And uh, he wrote the only novel about the four squadrons of black fighter pilots during World War II that had to fight two air forces in order to be recognized, the uh, Luftwaffe and uh, U.S. Army Air Corps, and uh, he'll, it's the real story. And uh, we also have uh, what this Stan has, has done. Uh, he's coming out with his latest, The Dogs of Brownsville, which is a story told in Godfather fashion about a group of guys and some girls who make it out of the slums of New York and get to Las Vegas in time to participate in the changing of the guard from the mob to Howard Hughes to corporate America. And uh, you don't want to miss this one. Uh, so let's start with that. Um, Stan, tell me and my co-host John all about this book. Hey, you said it all. <laughs> you don't need <laughs> me now. <laughs> well, it, it, it's a very, it is an amazing story. It covers a period of about almost 50 years. And uh, I would have to say, uh, aside from, from the stuff that I made up, it's all true. That's <laughs> awesome. That's fantastic. And, uh, I, I've been t well, and we just finished the artwork today for the cover. Just this morning was just finished, so uh, we'll be sending it off to the publisher probably by tomorrow. The publisher is Amazon, and hopefully it'll be out uh, sometime early June. I hope by time they we already have the ISBN number for it and so forth. They just have to do what they have to do, and we have to do a final check of the uh, copy material, and uh, it's ready to run. You're off and running with it. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Stan Westlater with us today. To you, I've gotten some preliminary reviews on this. Unless people are blowing smoke up my you-know-what, everybody seems to like it, and also the girls seem to like it more than the guys. At least from the comments that I've been getting back from those people that have looked at the uh, manuscript. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. So uh, Stan Weisleder with us today. He joins us live here in a broadcast. Uh, so this book, what, what, what led you to, to, to write this book? I always wanted to tell a story about what it was like growing up in the slums and getting out of there. And there were so many things that I wanted to tell. So uh, it took me, well, I thought about it for years, for years. And then when I finally sat down, I said, you know what, let me see if I could put together an outline. It took me about a year to do an outline of about 50 pages, roughly one page per chapter. And I had to do a lot of research because so much of it is true. 
the research, uh, it's about a foot high or longer. Now, remember my assistant saying to me, she found one of the stories that I incorporated, she found the actual story from the New York Daily News from way back in the, uh, in the early 50s. So, like I said, aside from the things that I made up, it's all true. And the hardest part about it was to weave together all of the events and all of the circumstances into one cohesive, smoothly flowing story. And uh, it took a while, and I think you'll like it. Awesome. We have got Stan Weisleder with us today. He joins us live here in the broadcast. He is a, a fantastic, fantastic individual. And uh, so John, uh, sitting here listening to Stan talk about his book, uh, you have any questions for him? What was probably the hardest thing that you had to go through to get the book published, or was it like a writer's block, or was it a? What would you say was the hardest uh, part about getting a book? Block all the time. That, that that's one of the things you always put up with. But I have a method for dealing with it. I don't work on one project at the same time. In writing school and classes, they tell you stick with one project until you're done. I don't do it that way. I'll have about a half a dozen, maybe, or at least three or four projects going at the same time. I'll get stuck on one, I put it aside, and I work on another one, and I get back to the first one when my brain has, uh, you know, refiltered everything and is ready to go again. So that's what I do. It works for me. Other people don't like that method. They stick with one thing until they're done, and then, then they're done. Uh, now, why do I do things like that? Well, for so many years I was in consulting, and when you are in consulting, you have to work on maybe a dozen different things at the same time. So you get used to that mode of working where you're not just working on one project, but maybe up to uh, you know, a few things. Just keep the things going. Keep them moving. So writer's block, yes, you get it all the time. But that's how I deal with it, by shifting gears to another project and then in getting back after my block is uh, unblocked. Awesome. hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, it does. We've got Stan Weisleder with us today. He joins us live here in our broadcast, and uh, his, his books are phenomenal. Stan has put a lot of time and effort into his great books. Uh, you never seem to sit still, my friend. Why are you always moving and going and doing? Uh, I thought it's obvious because it's hard <laughs> to hit a moving target. That's great. It is uh, Stan Wiseleader. He joins us today here on our broadcast. I'll tell you in the sheriff's department also. If you're moving, it's hard. It's harder for them to hit you. Now, talk a little bit about uh, being a detective with the uh, with the L.A. Sheriff's Department for 23 years. Uh, you must have seen some crazy, crazy stuff, my friend. Oh boy, I could I could tell you stories after stories. Oh, it, it's unbelievable. And I have to tell you, when you work with child abuse, what you read about in the papers, I have to tell you, sadly, it's only the tip of the iceberg. There is so much going on. It is so prevalent, and it crosses every economic and racial and ethnic line that you can imagine. It's all over, much more than you could ever imagine. And when you question and arrest these people, you know what? Most of them, they don't, they don't even think they were doing anything wrong. They thought it's, you know, it's natural. It's normal. And it, they just don't see it. You know, the one thing I've always said to people, you know, you could, you could steal something from someone. I steal your car. I steal your money. Uh, you take away a loved one from a person. Generally, you can always get those things back. But the one thing that kids have, their innocence, once you take that away from them, that they could never get back. So to me, working in child abuse 
was very important. It was more fun working in the field when you're working on patrol, you know, rolling on a on a code three. You know, there was nothing more exciting than that. That really gets your uh, <laughs> your adrenaline going. But when it came to child abuse cases, that's where you really did something worthwhile. Now, I know in L.A. they say that if you have a good attorney, you could murder somebody and maybe you get off with seven years if you have a real good attorney. In child abuse cases, we, we would have guys convicted for maybe up to 15 years. So as, as easy it was to may, – maybe as easy it was to murder someone in L.A., you sure didn't get – much slack if you were a child abuser. They really came down hard on those guys. And some of them were females, not too many. Uh, occasionally you'd get a female abuser of young boys, but those were rare. Usually it was the other way around. I'd say about 99% of the time it was the other way around, maybe 1%. Uh, I know I never worked on any cases where we had female abusers. But I know we did have them, but they were far and few between. And I have to tell you, uh, like I said, it's just the tip of the iceberg. I remember one case. This guy was doing his teenage daughter. And when we informed his wife about it, she was like in a trance. We had to search the entire house. He wasn't home then. We, he was arrested at his place of business. We searched the entire house. Of course, we found some drugs there, so we confiscated that. But we confiscated whatever weapons they had because we were afraid that when this guy came home and if we weren't there, his wife would have shot him. So we confiscated whatever weapons we found. Now, I could go on and on and tell you stories some of them are funny, some of them are sad, but it's the way it is. You know, it's, uh, I guess, part of life. Will we ever stop it? Will it ever come to an end? I don't know, probably not. You know, it's like, why does somebody like a blonde versus a redhead? Same reason somebody may like a little kid as opposed to an adult. It's all kinds of crazy stuff out there. Oh, yeah. We've got Stan Wiseleader with us today. He joins us live here in our broadcast, and uh, he has got uh, some incredible books out there. Uh, he wrote the only novel about the four squadrons of black fighter pilots during World War II. Talk to us about this, my friend. Oh, boy, that is a story that, uh, <laughs> wow. Well, I knew one of, the, uh, one of the original pilots, in fact, their ace, Lee Archer. He was our instructor for navigation and air tactics way, way, way back. And I had no I, – he was a black fighter pilot of World War II, but I had no idea what he went through, what those guys went through. And years later, I did some research and reading and found out, wow, there was a group of Tuskegee pilots during World War II – they were called Tuskegee pilots because they were trained at the Tuskegee Army Air Force Base uh, down south. And we had no idea what he had done. I didn't even know that he had shot down four or five German planes. He never spoke. He never bragged about what he did. He was just one of the instructors. But then when I started, I said, wait a minute, you know, let me see if I – can I, get, can I get a book to read about these guys? Well, there were no books except some textbooks. There were no novels. I like to read a novel about stories like that. And so I said to myself, you know what? Maybe I could write it. So I did a lot of research. It took me about 10 years to research that story. And I contacted him. He was already uh, out of the Air Force at that point. And I contacted him and I uh, had a few meetings with him, and I told him what I was doing. And he, and he said to me, why are you doing this? I said, well, you know, no one ever told your story. This is a story that has to be told. Anyway, I did it. It took me about 10 years to research, all in part-time, part because I, 
and was doing other things. And then it took me about another 10 years to write. And this story is the real story of what these guys went through. They had to fight not only the Luftwaffe, but also the U.S. Army Air Corps in order to get recognized. And when I started to write this, I started to write this story back in 1983, okay? That's when I actually started to write it. And uh, Lee Archer was still alive then. He passed away in 1990. And I remember he was invited to the inauguration for uh, Barack Obama because he was uh, a World War II ace, a black fighter pilot, not a basketball player or a football player. He's a fighter pilot, an ace, an American hero, a real American hero. Anyway, he died about a year after he was uh, one of the guests at Obama's inauguration. And uh, I had, I don't know how many meetings I had with him, showing him the progress that I was making, going from here to there. He would correct me and say, well, okay, that's not true, that's true, and so on and so forth. And then I kept, ha I kept having to remind him that I wasn't writing a textbook, I was writing a novel. So I have to make some leeway, I have to uh, you know, use some uh, discretion, uh, suspension of disbelief or whatever you want to call it when you're writing a novel as opposed to a uh, textbook. But anyway, uh, that too took a while and that uh, it came, it had a number of different printings and the most recent one, the title of the book is A Killer of Lions. And it's essentially a true story People ask me, do I write fiction or do I write history books? I say that I like to write faction. That's my word for fiction based on fact. That's what I do in all of my stories. And none of them are the same. They're all different. They all have different themes. But that particular story, A Killer of Lions, uh, when I first wrote it, I said to myself, gee, I don't know if it's any good, but you know what? I like it. And if I like it, I don't care if anyone else does or not. I tried to get that made into a movie, and it was too late. They had already had a number of different productions. Only two movies were ever made about these guys. One of them was a TV movie. And the other one was a movie called Red Tails, which came out a couple of years ago. Neither of those two really told the full story. So if you ever want to get the real story about these guys, pick up A Killer of Lions. Fantastic. What more can I say? <laughs> it, is, <laughs> it is Stan Wiseleader with us today. He joins us live here in the broadcast. And um, so... You have got a a pretty cool uh, stat here. You are uh, one of the oldest folks to go through the uh, Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, and the uh, oldest, the oldest. Yes, I tell me about this. The oldest. I have to tell you, when I was going through training, the next oldest guy in the class was thirty years younger than me, and he was an ex Marine gunnery sergeant. Wow. So the class material wasn't too bad. I was able to handle that pretty well. But the physical aspect was very, very demanding. I remember my chiropractor bills. I had chiropractor bills that were more than <laughs> doctor bills. bills. I was always getting injured. And I remember when I first started to get into training for it, I used to be fairly active as an athlete when I was younger, so I figured, oh, it's no big deal. I looked at the, uh, the stuff that you had to do for the physical aptitude test. I said, oh, this is a this piece of cake. So I go down to the local high school in Calabasas, and I uh, say to myself, I'll do a quick jog around the quarter-mile track. So I did the jog around the quarter-mile track, and you know what? 
I thought I was going to drop dead right then and there. I thought my life was ended, and that it was all over. That's how exhausted I was. I couldn't even breathe. I couldn't catch my breath. I laid there for I don't know how long. I was just totally, totally wiped out. So it, I knew, knew then I was not in good shape. I was in terrible shape. I went down to the gym. I spoke to the manager there, and I said, hey, can you get me into shape for this program? And he says, okay, for you, I'll do it. You'll be here tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., and we'll work out for six days a week. I said, are you kidding? 6 a.m.? I don't get up till 8 or 9 o'clock. 6 a.m. So I did that for six months. 6 a.m., six days a week. And I went from 178 pounds down to a lean 153, 25 pounds. And then I had to take my physical aptitude test, which consisted of a, a 500, 500, what is it, 500, 500 yard run, a 50 yard obstacle course. Uh, had to climb over an eight-foot high cyclone fence and had to drag a 185-pound dummy 15 yards. And, and the last item, I had to climb over a six-foot wall. That just about wiped me out because I'm only 5'4", okay? And... I remember the day that I completed the physical aptitude test. It felt like every bone in my body was broken. But I felt so good having completed the test because getting over that six-foot wall really scared the bejesus out of me. I wasn't sure that I could do it and uh, was able to do it. And then... uh, like they say, you know, just go through the program, do the best you can. And uh, that was about it. The assignments that we had, like I said, being in the field, that was the most exciting, in the field, on patrol, on the black and white. But the most productive cases were those working as a detective with child abuse because those guys were really put away. When we worked in the field, you know, doing regular patrol, those guys would be out in a day or two. But it was more, it was fun, but it was not as productive as working as a detective in child abuse. Any more questions? Well, John, do you have any questions for, for Stan while we've got him here? I was just kind of, I was having a good time listening to all the stories there and everything. What made you go from being in, you know, the being a law officer into the writing world. What was the big impetus for that? Well, first of all, when I was a kid, I always wanted to be a cop. But when I was a kid, they had a height requirement of 5'10". When I was about 14, I realized there was no way that I was going to reach 5'10". And then years later, I guess because, uh, you know, they couldn't get enough applicants, the height requirements were eliminated all over the country as long as you could pass your tests. And by that time, uh, wow, I was already over the hill. I was kind of old. You know, I had a few kids, a mortgage, you know, married a number of years, a dog, a cat, but uh, decided, you know, let me see if I could do this. So that's something I was always wanted to do. As far as writing, that's another thing I always wanted to do. But I never had the opportunity, never had the chance until years later. I said, you know what? Why don't I do these things? You, know, you only live once. At least that's what I've heard. So do these things that you thought of. If you don't do it, if you don't try it, you'll always wonder, gee, maybe... Should I have? Could I have? What if I did? What if I didn't? Try it, you know. And if you don't, if if you're not successful at it, okay, at least you've tried. You've given it a shot. So that was the same with becoming a cop and becoming a writer. 
Before that, I worked as an actuary for most of my life, and that was safe. It was indoors, very boring, but it was a good living. Can't complain about that. Absolutely. There you have it. You have my whole life in front of you now. <laughs> yeah, see, I was kind of a, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a law officer. Then I developed a temper about midway through my teen years, and I figured it probably wouldn't be wise for me to have a job with a firearm, so that's all I wanted to do when I was a little kid, but in a weird route, it was a little bit different, like you had the height requirement, me, I just had a bad temper, so. Well, about that height requirement, you know, there were some guys in the class, like six foot guys, six feet tall, they were able to go over that six foot wall like with a hop, skip, and jump, it was unbelievable. And some of the younger ones, you know, even even the girls, those who are, that were really athletic, that were in great shape, they too were able to bounce up and get over that wall real quick. For me, it was a struggle. It really was. I had to work on my upper body strength and have to jump up and just be able to grab the top of the wall and pull myself over. That's not the way you're supposed to do it, but that was the only way that I could. But it doesn't matter. As long as you get over it, I don't care any which way you can. Just get over the top, and once you're off the top, you can just roll over to the other side and fall down. As long as you make it over, they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> that's that. That's pretty amazing. It is uh, Stan Wise Leader with us today. Uh, Stan, I, I appreciate you making time for me and John today. This has definitely been a, uh, a fun interview. And, uh, I guess before we let you go, how do people buy your books and, uh, and get involved with you, my friend? Well, it's, uh, the publisher is, uh, Amazon. It should be out by, uh, I'm hoping sometime in the next week or two. Like I said, we just finished the artwork for the cover this morning. So it has to be uploaded to them probably by tomorrow. And as far as the others, uh, you can look them up. Uh, well, you could look up a killer of lions. Uh, that's available. Just Google it, a killer of lions. But this one here, I think, is going to be a winner. I think, I think you really like it. The Dogs of Brownsville. It'll be out in about a week or two at the most, I hope. And like I said, we already have the ISBN number, so it's uh, ready to be registered. And uh, just look for it soon. <laughs> should be out soon. You should be able to get it without any problem. What they're going to charge for it, I have no idea. Well, I'll tell you, you, you you've put a uh, a really cool piece of business here together, and uh, I appreciate you making time for me and John. Thanks for coming on, Stan. Hey, it's been my pleasure, and any time, if you want me to come back and talk about some sheriff department stories, I'd be glad to. Cause some of them, some of them will, will uh, it, well, I, let's hold off until we get to that point. Yes, some of these yes. you really love. Well, uh, we, will, we will definitely be in touch. Thank you, my friend, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Stan. Oh, okay, you take care. And uh, we are going to take a timeout. When we